Divorce nearly drained my entire $850,000, but I strategically outplayed my unfaithful wife in court, presenting compelling evidence. Being an elementary school teacher means my routine is fairly fixed, with predictable hours at school. Tuesdays typically involve staff meetings, which often extend until 6.30 p.m., ensuring I'm back home by 7.30 p.m. My wife of 20 years, Kimberly, usually felt worn out on Tuesday evenings after her gym sessions. Thus, I took charge of dinner while she freshened up and managed other household tasks. However, one day, the principal unexpectedly called off the staff meeting at 4.40 p.m. I saw it as an opportunity to get a head start on dinner and catch up on overdue chores at home. I sensed a growing distance with Kimberly and hoped that the peaceful dinner and a break from our usual routines might rekindle our intimacy. Our marriage had been facing challenges, particularly around finances. I observed Kimberly drifting away, striving for more control over our lives and becoming increasingly obstinate and confrontational when things didn't align with her expectations. Despite these hurdles, I prided myself on my patience. Upon returning home today, my routine unfolded much like any other day. I parked in our garage, deliberately located a distance away from our house. This arrangement stemmed from our desire to shield our kids from car noises during their tender years, ensuring their uninterrupted sleep. A crucial component, not only for their well-being, but also for our own mental respite as they peacefully slumbered. With my car parked, I made my serene trek towards our two-story abode. Kimberly's presence in the driveway, marked by her car, was a familiar sight on her gym days, as she typically opted for public transportation to her workout sessions. Entering through the rear entrance, my initial inclination was towards tidying up. Known from my knack for household repairs, I took pride in maintaining all hinges and movable parts to perfection, ensuring they operated seamlessly without a hint of noise. Both Kimberly and I shared a mutual disdain for creaky hinges or noisy doors. Yet, my attention swiftly diverted as I noticed Kimberly's purse resting untouched on the kitchen counter, an anomaly that would undoubtedly unsettle her. Kimberly held a meticulous habit of keeping her belongings within arm's reach, regardless of her location within the house. This unexpected sight prompted a closer inspection, revealing further anomalies. Her gym attire, comprising a snug leotard and a sizable towel, lay abandoned on the floor adjacent to the kitchen counter. Then a series of sounds emanated from our upstairs bedroom, sparking concern that Kimberly might have taken ill. Swiftly, I ascended the stairs with caution, striving for silence. However, I nearly stumbled over a pair of men's shoes carelessly left on the steps, certainly not belonging to me. As I proceeded, a trail of men's trousers, shirts, a t-shirt, socks, and scattered pieces of Kimberly's intimate lingerie, typically reserved for special occasions like our anniversary, littered the rest of the staircase. My movement halted abruptly, my skin turning clammy as disbelief gave way to a surge of anger. For someone accustomed to maintaining composure, honed through years of teaching and managing 27 children daily, this eruption of emotion was unprecedented. Adrenaline surged through my veins, igniting a rage I had never before experienced, let alone entertain the thought of engaging in physical altercation. Despite the unfamiliarity of these intense feelings, curiosity propelled me forward. En route to the bedroom, I had to traverse the in-suite bathroom, leading to our expansive walk-in closet, and finally, the bedroom itself. Peering through the slightly ajar closet door, my eyes fell upon a scene akin to a horror film rendering me unable to divert my gaze. The cacophony of moans and groans that had echoed through the house suddenly overwhelmed me, mingling with a potent blend of fury and disbelief that coursed through my veins. Clutching my phone tightly, I began recording the harrowing scene unfolding before me. It was a desperate attempt to anchor the surreal reality of betrayal, to solidify it into tangible evidence rather than a nightmare haunting my subconscious. This footage would become my lifeline, my ammunition for the inevitable confrontation with Kimberly. My gaze remained fixated on the agonizing spectacle of deceit playing out before me. In front of me stood the woman I had loved, trusted, and shared my life with, my wife, the mother of our grown children, 
a 43-year-old who embodied qualities of exercise, charity, and professed affection for me. Yet, in this moment, she embodied the essence of betrayal in its most brutal and unfiltered form. With a heavy heart, I reluctantly halted the recording, silently retracing my steps down the stairs. Stepping outside, I found myself aimlessly wandering, directionless, and adrift. Eventually, I sought solace in a distant park, miles away from the shattered remains of my home. Splashing cool water on my face, I settled onto a bench and cautiously revisited the footage on my phone, lowering the volume to avoid disturbing the children playing nearby. There, amidst the digital landscape, lay the wreckage of my life. My marriage, once a cornerstone of stability, now reduced to mere pixels on a screen. Around 7.15 p.m., my customary return hour on days with staff meetings, I stepped back into our home, lingering at the rear entrance. Kimberly's keen eye immediately caught onto my disarrayed appearance, the telltale signs of red eyes and a pallid complexion. With genuine concern etched across her face, she inquired, Honey, what's the matter? You look really unwell. Are you okay? Let me fix your drink. Her eyes spoke volumes of her worry, yet I couldn't bring myself to disclose the true cause of my anguish. Summoning a shaky voice, I replied, Not feeling great, something's upset my stomach. Maybe lunch. I think I'll just take a shower and turn in. Kimberly, ever the caring spouse, responded, All right, sweetheart, but take a basin with you in case you feel nauseous. Wouldn't want you staining the fresh sheets. Little did she know, those once pristine linens were now tainted with a far more profound betrayal than any spilled meal. I'll sleep in the guest room tonight until I feel better. I declared with a newfound resolve, retreating to the ground floor guest quarters. In the days that followed, Kimberly continued her routine, seemingly oblivious to my turmoil. Meanwhile, I maintained a facade of normalcy at work, while seeking refuge in the guest room under the pretense of a potential illness. Yet, I knew I couldn't sustain this charade indefinitely. After some time, I mustered the courage to return to our bedroom, though sleeping amidst the echoes of betrayal proved to be an immense challenge. Life continued its facade of normalcy, but by Monday, I had resolved on my course of action. I needed to ascertain whether this betrayal was an ongoing affair or an isolated incident. To facilitate this, I informed my principal of an unforeseen medical procedure scheduled for the following day, prompting him to arrange a substitute teacher for my class. On Tuesday morning, I departed home as usual, parking several streets away from our neighborhood before retracing my steps back to our street. Familiar with the back entrances of neighboring yards near our house, I proceeded cautiously, ensuring not to draw attention from any watchful neighbors, until reaching the garage at the rear of our property. There, I exchanged my attire for casual clothes and soft, silent socks conducive to noiseless movement. And so, the waiting game began. Recalling that no additional vehicle had been present when I unexpectedly returned the previous Tuesday, I couldn't rely on the sound of a car's arrival to signal the presence of any visitors. They must have arrived and departed on foot. Stealthily navigating through our gardens, I positioned myself in a discreet vantage point where I could surveil our front door, concealed by the hedges and foliage we had cultivated for privacy from the road. I waited in silence, keenly attuned to the familiar sounds of Kimberly going about her daily routine, oblivious to my presence. Her unwavering confidence in the predictability of her tasks was palpable as she seamlessly moved from the kitchen to chores, laundry, and operating the dishwasher. The rhythm continued into activities in the living room, like vacuuming and dusting, until approximately 11.20am then. Kimberly ascended the stairs, the faint sound of the shower followed by a brief silence punctuated by the flush of the toilet before her return downstairs. Around 55 minutes later, she opened the front door and left it slightly ajar, signaling the potential arrival of a visitor. It didn't take long. By about 12.20 p.m., he appeared. Approaching from the left side of our front door, my phone captured roughly 15 seconds of video recording, capturing side profiles, and even a nearly direct view of his face. Without hesitation, he entered and proceeded through the doorway. The words that followed shook me to the core. Hi, honey. 
Hope you're ready for another great workout. He greeted, to which Kimberly responded with familiarity. Of course, you always love it when I wear these sometimes. Their ease with each other hinted that this wasn't an isolated incident. As they made their way to the bedroom, I retreated to the garage, grappling with a whirlwind of emotions. Questions raced through my mind. Who was this man? Doubts about any future intimacy with Kimberly lingered, overshadowed by concerns about potential risks if she was involved with others. Why had she never broached the topic of her feelings? Recollections of Kimberly's gym visits over the past 2.5 years flooded my thoughts. Perhaps the gym held the key to unraveling the mysteries of our troubled relationship. As a teacher, I had the advantage of access to computers, printers, and various resources. I opted to kickstart my investigation by printing profile pictures extracted from the recordings on my phone, aiming to discern the identities of those involved. It seemed logical that this initial step might eventually illuminate the reasons behind the situation, as pinpointing who was implicated proved to be relatively straightforward. The following Thursday, coinciding with Kimberly's routine gym session, I suggested accompanying her, expressing interest in potentially becoming a member myself, especially with the break from school afforded by midterm assessments. However, Kimberly seemed hesitant, offering excuses such as it being a gathering primarily for Julie and her friends, where they mainly engaged in casual conversation during the session. Undeterred by her weak rationale, I persisted in my intention to join her at the gym. On a subsequent Thursday, my entrance into the gym mirrored a scene from an old Western film, but all eyes turned to scrutinize the newcomer stepping into the saloon. Whispers rippled through the air among the women, a gazes lingering on me. Kimberly attempted to downplay the attention, attributing it to the unusual sight of her being accompanied during her usual gym sessions. The workout session commenced with the customary warm-ups and stretches, followed by a rigorous hour and a half of rotating between exercise stations targeting various muscle groups. Despite my efforts to keep pace, I found myself needing to pause around the 50-minute mark as my blood sugar plummeted, prompting a craving for something sweet. Kimberly, understanding my predicament, fetched some glucose tablets and guided me to a nearby chair where I could recuperate. As I rested, my focus shifted towards observing Kimberly more closely. It became apparent that she was visibly anxious, frequently casting glances towards the staff area where the instructors made their entrance into the main hall. Sensing her unease, I couldn't help but scrutinize the layout of the gym itself. It adhered to the standard design found in fitness facilities worldwide, with exercise stations strategically placed around the room and mirrors positioned at each station to allow participants to monitor their form and muscle development. Eager to pass the time while waiting for my energy levels to stabilize, I decided to explore the gym further. My attention was drawn to a wall near the hallway exit adorned with staff information. Curiosity peaked, I examined the top photo, depicting a woman radiating an aura of fitness and vitality. Though her age was difficult to ascertain, I recognized her as Catherine Davis, the director and owner of the establishment. Beneath her photo, contact details and operating hours were prominently displayed. Below Catherine's photo, I noticed three more images, two women and a man. In that moment, a stark realization washed over me. He was Kimberly's paramour, the man entangled in an affair with my wife, seemingly with her eager compliance. Absorbing this revelation, I perused his description. Mr. Jeremy, head of exercise regimen, planning, and personal training. As I mentally noted down his contact details, I realized Kimberly was no longer the station where I last spotted her, prompting me to return to my seat. With a heightened sense of vigilance, I meticulously scanned each station in search of my wife. After a brief moment of searching, I finally spotted her engrossed in what appeared to be an intense conversation with a man partially concealed behind weightlifting equipment. Positioned near the entrance to the staff area, he seemed to have been intercepted from entering, presumably by Kimberly herself. Gesturing for him to depart, she hastened back to her station, unaware of my observation of her clandestine exchange. Rage surged within me, a sensation entirely foreign. When Kimberly eventually returned to my side, she noticed my discomfort. 
Took you a while to recover your blood sugar, she remarked, concern etched on her face. I tersely replied in the affirmative, asserting my readiness to depart before she could offer further inquiry. Just then, Miss Miller's voice boomed over the gym's sound system, interrupting our interaction. She informed us that the usual final session of exercises for the night wouldn't take place due to Mr. Wilson falling suddenly ill and having to leave. This announcement was met with discontent and disappointment from most of the women present, indicating that Mr. Wilson's session held considerable significance for many. I silently resolved to delve deeper into this matter. Kimberly remained silent during the announcement, her reaction almost appearing relieved. Quickly gathering her towel and bag from the designated area for belongings, Kimberly and I prepared to depart. However, before we could leave, one of the women, initially unrecognized by me, approached Kimberly. It's a shame Jeremy couldn't finish the session as usual tonight, she commented. Kimberly responded with a curt yeah, before making her way to the car, clearly signaling her reluctance to engage further on the matter. See you, Kimberly uttered dismissively as she swiftly entered the car, exhibiting a haste I had not witnessed before. The ride home was marked by silence, with Kimberly appearing relaxed, her head tilted back, and eyes closed as she took deliberate, slow breaths. Observing these changes in her behavior, I couldn't help but wonder if her apparent relief might provide an opportunity to glean more insight into the situation. That was quite an interesting session, dear, I remarked, breaking the silence as we drove home. The training station seemed very well organized. Thank you, honey, Kimberly replied with a smile. They do offer an extensive program, and I really enjoy going there. The women are so friendly too. Curiosity getting the better of me, I probed further. You mean about Mr. Wilson? I asked, catching her off guard. Jeremy, I mean, she corrected hastily. Jeremy Wilson. He usually concludes each session with a challenging exercise routine that really pushes everyone to their limits. It was disappointing he wasn't there tonight. I couldn't shake off the feeling that Kimberly was fully committed to this deception, seamlessly weaving her fabrications about Mr. Wilson. Maybe next Thursday he'll feel better, I'd offer it nonchalantly, though my mind was preoccupied with thoughts of the impending rendezvous between my wife and Mr. Wilson. As the following Thursday arrived, it was time to return to the routine of the school week. Assigned to pick up the kids, I found myself immersed in the chaotic scene that unfolded during the post-school rush. Parents eagerly awaited their children amidst a flurry of activity, navigating through the line of parked cars with patience and anticipation, hoping to spot their little ones ready and waiting as they reached the front. To my surprise, as the end of pickup time approached, a car pulled up, and behind the wheel was the same woman who had attempted to strike up a conversation with Kimberly at the gym the previous evening. Hello, she greeted me, her turn slightly flustered. I'm sorry, but I'm new to this whole kit pickup thing and completely lost track of time. Is my son Jeff here? As educators, we were accustomed to situations like this, especially with parents new to the school, so I reassured her while the other teachers supervised the remaining children. I located Jeff Moore's classroom and found him engaged in conversation with another staff member's son. Hey Jeff, I called out. Your mom's here to pick you up. Come with me to the pickup barrier. His reaction seemed a bit perplexed. Jeff was in his final year of elementary school and didn't strike me as a forgetful type. It's strange, he remarked. My mom usually gets tied up with her gym instructor on Friday afternoons. She often picks me up late from my previous school, sometimes not until around 5.40. His mention of a gym instructor piqued my suspicions, but I maintained my composure and continued the conversation, striving to appear calm and unaffected. It's great to hear that your mom prioritizes her health. Exercise is such an important aspect of a healthy lifestyle. I commented, trying to mask my growing unease. By any chance, do you know the name of the instructor? I asked, hoping his response wouldn't confirm my suspicions. Oh, his name is Wilson or something, Jeff replied casually. He also works at a local gym and often gives private classes at people's homes. That's what I want to do when I grow up. As Jeff continued to speak fondly of his mom's workouts with Mr. Wilson on Friday afternoons, my apprehensions deepened. 
It can't be just this, I thought to myself. If Mr. Wilson was involved with more people than just my wife, I escorted Jeff back to his car, where his mom expressed gratitude for our concern. No problem, I assured her. It's all part of the service. By the way, I don't think we've met before. I'm Peter Taylor. Nice to meet you. She shook my hand and introduced herself. Hi, I'm Julie Brown. I remember seeing you at the gym last Thursday, she said. I was there with my wife, Kimberly. As she hurried off, I couldn't help but notice the abrupt change in her demeanor compared to before. The absence of Mr. Wilson seemed to have disrupted everyone's routine that night, including hers. She had started as a typical mother, simply apologizing for picking up her son late from school. But suddenly, her demeanor shifted, her complexion paling, and her manner becoming reserved. She seemed almost jittery as she responded, Yes, that's fine. I'll see you again, Mr. Taylor. Goodbye before swiftly departing. As she vanished from sight, I found myself confronted with the daunting task of mapping out my future, a future that I had once envisioned alongside my partner, Kimberly. Yet now, that future appeared bleak, perhaps involving only myself and no one else, certainly not Kimberly. Driven by a surge of anger, I found myself veering down a path I had never imagined, the path of revenge. Methodically, I began to scrutinize every intricate detail that constituted the fabric of our everyday life as a couple. Questions flooded my mind. Who was responsible for paying the bills? What insurance company did we use? How were our utility bills managed, and from which account were they paid? As my understanding of our financial situation expanded, I was surprised to discover that we had very little left on our mortgage, and my retirement account had impressively grown to $850,000. Grateful for the mandatory contributions imposed by our teachers' union, I couldn't help but reflect on the benefits they provided as part of the basic employment conditions for teachers. After conducting a thorough online investigation into Kimberly's affairs, I reluctantly concluded that there was no escaping the fact that we would need to divide all our assets equally. Our children were now financially independent, and we had a substantial sum saved in a cash account. Around $27,000 earmarked for a planned trip abroad that was no longer on the horizon. My first step would be to deplete the account discreetly before Kimberly realized I had uncovered her betrayal. To achieve this, I subtly tampered with several home appliances, causing them to malfunction. I would disconnect a wire here and there when Kimberly was not at home then claim that a repair technician had come to fix the appliance, charging a certain amount in cash, slightly less than the established price. I discreetly hid this money and then repaired the appliance through this method. Through these maneuvers, I managed to save around $17,000. Additionally, I purchased tools and equipment, always paying in cash. I would show them to Kimberly and then return them the next day for a cash refund. I admit it was deceitful, but the values of honesty and integrity had already eroded in our relationship due to Kimberly's actions. The whole situation was turning me into someone I never thought I could be, a liar. Kimberly's Thursday evening training sessions with Wilson persisted, and I no longer attempted to maintain any semblance of a romantic relationship with her. We simply existed together, occupying the same space like two housemates. Over time, my personal belongings began to vanish into boxes stored in the garage. Kimberly rarely ventured into the garage, so she didn't notice the gradual reorganization. With her car typically parked in front of it, she seemed content to leave the garage as my own domain. On one occasion she inquired about the absence of some of my personal items from the shelves, but I evaded the question, attributing it to accidental breakage or lack of necessity. Kimberly accepted these explanations, largely because most of my belongings didn't align with her preferred color scheme or the desired ambience of our living space. As my possessions dwindled in this manner, it didn't significantly alter the atmosphere in the house. Reflecting on how much I had yielded to Kimberly's influence in various aspects of our shared life, I made a decision to withdraw as much as possible from our joint fund and purchase a small house on the outskirts of town. While compact with only two bedrooms and a modest yard, it boasted a garage and was conveniently situated near my workplace at the school. What made it even more appealing 
was that the remaining mortgage balance allowed me to comfortably afford the monthly payments, even with only half of my salary. Though far from a lavish mansion, it was a testament to the value of seeking out hidden gems in less flashy neighborhoods. With my separation plans underway, I gradually relocated my personal belongings to the new house. As for furniture, sourcing it from second-hand stores proved to be a straightforward solution. It was time for those involved to reap the consequences of their actions. I crossed paths with Julie Brown once again during school pickup. She seemed distressed as she approached, her eyes betraying recent tears. Trained to pick up on such signals as a teacher, I sensed the weight of her emotions. Mr. Taylor, can I talk to you for a minute? She asked anxiously. Of course, since no one else is arriving, just park over there and come to my usual spot, I replied, gesturing towards the benches around the school, which served as my makeshift office. While Jeff entertained himself with his soccer ball, July parked her car, and we sat together on a nearby bench. I'm not sure how to start. What I need to tell you, she began, her voice trembling with uncertainty. I know that Kimberly, my wife, likes to go there, and it has been beneficial in helping her stay fit and active. I responded cautiously, studying her reaction. July hesitated, clearly struggling to find the right words for continuing. There are things you should know about what's happening there. I inquired, is this about Jeremy Wilson? She responded emphatically, you have no idea how involved that guy is. I might have an idea, but please go on and tell me, I'd urged. With confidence, she continued, he's a womanizer, targeting many of the regulars there. When I inquired about her knowledge, she replied with tears in her eyes. I was one of them until last week. We met every Friday at 1310. She paused, her gaze lifting, as if she were reliving those moments. I glanced away, recalling those sessions, and she apologized. I'm sorry for sharing this. I really enjoyed what we had while it lasted. She expressed her disappointment, revealing, it was only when he had someone else filling my slot during that time that he ended it abruptly without explanation. Just a sorry no more. In fact, I thought we might have a future. I'm divorced and miss the regular affection of a marital relationship. Struck by her candor, I pondered how she could find it appropriate to share all this with me. Sensing her distress, I attempted to offer some comfort, hastily remarking, marital relationships aren't always what they seem. She observed the pain and anguish in my expression, prompting a deeper understanding between us. Do you already know, she asked, shaking her head slowly in disbelief. You already know that he's been involved with Kimberly, your wife. I admitted, yes, I knew July. Thank you for sharing this, though, struggling to hide the bitterness in my voice. I've already set things in motion regarding the whole situation. I really believe in karma. I think it might catch up with him soon. That guy has to face the consequences. July practically shouted, he doesn't care who he hurts or how, as long as it satisfies his sexual ego. Something he can brag about to friends at the bar. If you want my help to get back at him, just let me know. That guy needs to pay, and he should pay dearly. With that, she called her son and left me deep in thought for a long time. My plan for revenge felt like bitter solace worn from my inability to salvage my marriage. I realized it needed deeper consideration. I began to ponder how many other women he might be involving at the gym. It was time to gather concrete evidence. Despite my marvel at the man's audacity, I recognized that even the most shameless individuals don't tire easily. I discovered he worked at the gym every day, except Mondays when it was closed. Recalling the phone number posted on the gym's wall, I utilized the white pages to trace it to an address no more than three blocks from ours. It explained how that scoundrel could conveniently walk to our place to have affairs with my soon-to-be ex-wife. I informed Kimberly that I would begin going for walks every day around 5.10 p.m., citing my doctor's recommendation. Fortunately, Kimberly showed no interest in joining me, and I knew it wouldn't interfere with her appointments. On my first evening walk, I made a beeline for the man's address and observed that he resided in a ground floor apartment among several similar units. His car was absent, so I lingered nearby to track his return. Consistently, he departed our house before 6.10pm, making it likely he'd arrive around that time. 
As expected, he entered his apartment just before 6 p.m., repeating this pattern daily. It became evident that on the days the gym was open, he met with a different woman. Each time, I resolved to find out more by starting my walks earlier to monitor his movements throughout the day. Deciding to take a full week off from school, I prepared to delve deeper into the truth. For this specific purpose, I visited an electronic store and acquired the necessary equipment. Among the items purchased were a long-range listening device resembling a satellite dish, along with voice and motion-activated cameras boasting high-definition full-color capabilities, five cameras to be exact. To ensure ample storage space for digital evidence, I also procured an additional portable hard drive for my computer. After obtaining these tools on Monday, I proceeded to install one of the cameras in the man's apartment. Fortunately, his living space wasn't overly expansive, resembling more of a one-bedroom apartment with a spacious living and kitchen area. A single camera sufficed to cover most areas except his bedroom. Placing it there proved straightforward. I simply waited for him to depart for the gym and retrieved his apartment keys, carelessly left under the doormat. The process couldn't have been less imaginative. After ensuring the camera functioned correctly, I departed. Now, whenever he made a movement or sound in his apartment, the camera, equipped with a microphone, would activate and livestream both video and audio to my computer, securely storing the data with dates. It commenced operating as soon as Wilson returned home on Monday night, capturing clear images of him enjoying a takeout meal in front of his TV before retiring to bed around 10.20 p.m. On Tuesday, I bided my time until the gym closed, then slipped in through the back door, often overlooked during pre-closing checks in most establishments. Luck was on my side. I strategically positioned the next camera in the private room located at the back, where clients typically underwent personal health assessments. This room doubled as a space where Wilson often conducted sessions with his clients. As I set up the camera, I couldn't help but question the person I had become, installing cameras in other spaces and essentially spying on them. I pondered where this path would lead. On Wednesday, seizing the opportunity when Kimberly went shopping, I discreetly placed the third and fourth cameras in our bedroom and living room, reviewing the footage from Tuesday. What I observed and heard simultaneously shocked and unsurprised me, given the circumstances. Wilson woke up and left hastily, only to return later with breakfast. I couldn't help but think, this lazy guy can't even make his own breakfast. He stayed home until the gym opened, departing at 10.45 a.m. during this time. He made an intriguing call. Hey Francis, it's Jeremy. I'm already out of the house. Okay, see you at 12.20 at your place. Make sure to bring what I mentioned. No, I'll be careful. No one will see me enter your house. You said he's gone for four days. All right, maybe I can come Thursday and Friday too. We'll talk this afternoon. After the call, I continued to observe closely. He departed with a noticeable spring in his step, leaving me to wonder how he planned to explain his actions to Kimberly on Thursday. I set up my makeshift command center in the garage, eager for the unfolding events to be revealed on my computer screen. Soon, his footsteps appeared on my monitor. As the day progressed, he woke up, went out for breakfast again, and then made a call this time to Kimberly. The camera transmitted his side of the conversation too. Hey, it's Jeremy. How's my favorite girl feeling today? Kimberly's cautious response was clear. Jeremy, don't talk like that on the phone. You never know who might be listening. Fortunately, my husband left for work. See you at 12.20 as usual. Julie, the school mom, seemed eager to help in any way possible. So, I asked her to compile a list of women that Scandrel had been involved with or had been in the past. She approached this task with enthusiasm, and in a week she had names and addresses. To my surprise and dismay, Kimberly's name was on that list. I had nearly severed all ties with my house, which had lost its emotional value and become merely a dwelling. Kimberly had once commented on how it felt strangely empty lately. I simply explained that I was diligently getting rid of my belongings. She accepted this explanation, as it didn't affect her possessions and even provided her more space. 
I also moved items from the garage to my new house to complete my departure. It only took a 25 minute effort to pick up my remaining belongings and drive away in my car. I sought counsel from a divorce attorney and all necessary paperwork was prepared and ready for immediate service. Financial matters were settled with our vacation savings fully emptied and transferred to my personal account. I meticulously saved receipts from any suspicious purchases, organizing them in a folder for potential evidence. Beneficiaries of my retirement fund were updated to our children and I withdrew any available funds. I established separate bank accounts, credit cards and insurance policies, all solely in my name. The car registration and insurance were transferred entirely to her name, making her solely responsible for it. Unfortunately, I had no control over the house, so I had to defer to the court's decisions. I purchased a new cell phone registered solely in my name, ensuring the number remained unlisted, or deactivating the old phone. I compiled an information packet for each spouse or partner of the women Julie mentioned. Each packet contained details about when and where that scoundrel had been involved with their partners, including his name and address. Additionally, I included the address of the local sexual health clinic, as it appeared many of these encounters were unprotected. I composed a detailed letter to the gym owner, urging them to address the serious situation involving their lead instructor. On our kitchen table, I laid out divorce papers, printed photos from the surveillance footage of Wilson and Kimberly, and DVDs containing their encounters. Alongside this package, I placed my wedding ring, halved and smeared with unpleasant substances, symbolizing the state of our marriage. Accompanying the package was a note addressed to Kimberly, explaining the significance of the damaged ring and instructing her to communicate only through the attorney mentioned in the divorce papers. I informed her of my request to the school to restrict her access and warn against causing any disruptions there, as it could result in police intervention. I'd also informed our children about my actions to ensure clarity regarding the breakup. Copies of the DVDs were sent to them to prevent any misconceptions about the reasons behind our separation. Retreating to my new house, I braced myself for the repercussions, which arrived with full force. News of a scandal at a nearby gym had somehow reached the local newspapers. Rewrite. The owner had no choice but to shut down the business in Clifton. Meanwhile, an ex-instructor from the gym was found in a downtown alley, believed to have been assaulted by an unidentified group of male attackers. A sudden surge of divorce petitions flooded the local court, and many homes were put up for sale. Kimberly returned home. That faithful day discovered my parting gifts immediately fainted. A neighbor heard her scream and saw her collapse. Our observant 73-year-old neighbor quickly realized why Kimberly fainted and immediately called the emergency services before leaving her house. Kimberly tried to contact me, but was unsuccessful on any of our phones. She even attempted to visit the school, resulting in her arrest and spending a night in jail, receiving a stern warning from a magistrate. Her efforts to reach me considerably diminished. After that, our children did not hold back in expressing their disapproval of her blatant infidelity. Fortunately, both were married and had inherited stronger ethical opinions from me. Clearly, not from Kimberly. The divorce proceedings were completed and the remaining financial matters were resolved. Kimberly had to sell the house and the proceeds allowed her to buy a smaller house in the outskirts where she currently resides alone. The stigma being known as one of the infamous gym girls never left her. Each time she ventured into town, she faced numerous Cylon glances and whispered giggles. The resulting depression from this rejection and shame eventually led her to seek care at a psychiatric hospital. Update. As the dust settled from the tumultuous events that had unfolded, I found solace in the routine of my teaching profession. Yet, amidst the calm of my daily life, an unexpected twist awaited me. One crisp autumn morning, as I wandered through the city park, a peculiar sound caught my attention. It was a faint, melodious humming drifting through the rustling leaves. Curious, I followed the sound to a secluded clearing, where a woman, ethereal and radiant, sat playing a harp with delicate fingers. Intrigued by her presence, I struck up a conversation, 
and thus began an enchanting exchange that transcended the ordinary bounds of acquaintanceship. She revealed herself to be a travelling musician, weaving tales of faraway lands through her haunting melodies. We spent hours lost in conversation, sharing our dreams and aspirations beneath the golden hues of the autumn sun. With each passing day, our connection deepened, and I found myself drawn to her in ways I had never experienced before. She was a wanderer, a nomad, and yet in her, I found a sense of home I had long been searching for. As the seasons turned and winter's chill descended upon us, I made a decision that would alter the course of my life forever. I invited her to stay, to share my home and my heart, and to my delight she accepted. Together, we embarked on a journey of love and discovery, each day unfolding like a verse in a timeless ballad. She brought music and joy into my life, filling the empty spaces left behind by past sorrows. In her, I found not just a partner, but a kindred spirit, a soulmate whose presence illuminated the darkest corners of my being. And as we stood hand in hand, gazing up at the starlit sky, I knew that our love was destined to endure, transcending the trials of time and fate. Friends, share your opinion about this story. Have a nice vacation. Check out my other videos.